Hello and welcome to the third in our um, webinars in the build-up to our crowdfunding campaign. Um, today's webinar is named Disabled in 2020 and we have four fantastic guests that are going to be discussing various topics in regards to Disabled in 2020 with us. So without further ado, we'll, we'll get on with things. Um, and we're going to start with some introductions. So if we go over to Sam, um, who will introduce herself um, now for you. Hi there, um, I'm Samantha Rank, and I am a broadcaster and disability rights campaigner. Currently in my pyjamas in London. <laughs> okay, we'll go to Ross. Hi, I'm um, Ross Hovey. I am uh, an accessibility manager for a uh, large bank in the UK and I'm currently in Cambridgeshire. Thank you, Ross. And over to Ben. Hi there, I'm Ben Clark. I'm a C7 quadriplegic for his spinal cord injury and I'm a personal trainer too. I run Adapt to Perform, the world's largest YouTube channel that is dedicated to fitness for wheelchair users. And in the background, I do a little bit of consultancy work trying to improve the fitness industry with their accessibility. Thank you, Ben. And finally, Phil. Yes, hi, uh, everybody. My name is Phil Friend, wheelchair user, check shirt, just eaten bacon and eggs, um, <laughs> so I'm a feeling a bit indigested. Um, I used to be a consultant working for people like Ross, actually, many years back, but now I'm more likely to be found podcasting and uh, acting as a consultant inappropriate, but I'm chair of the Research Institute for Disabled Consumers, which is an important organisation from our point of view, disabled people's point of view. I'm also the vice chair of the Activity Alliance, which I'm sure Ben will know something about. So. Uh, that's me. Fantastic. Thank you all for those introductions. Um, right, so let's go straight into things in terms of the first question, which is what are the barriers facing disabled people in 2020? I'll let any of you lead this one. Um, so what do we think? Who wants to go first? Um, I was, I, I can't ever, I'm waiting for Sam, but she, I'd be to the Oh, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go first. I'll go first. Let me go first. So I think, I, I think very much the issues that were concerning the disability community 10, 20 years ago are, you know, are just as topical as they are today. I kind of get really, really annoyed at people going, oh, well, yeah, but things are better though, aren't they? I mean, you know, because we saw loads of you on the Paralympics and, you know, you, you now and again pop up on television. So everything must be absolutely hunky-dory. But, you know, the reality is, and, you know, as we are in the midst of a pandemic, um, it's just shown that disabled people are definitely at the bottom of the pecking order. You know, we're constantly at the, you know, at the, the receiving end of austerity, you know, benefit cuts, you know, support cuts. Um, and, and not that, you know, I sound really doom and gloom, but, the, you know, the reality is we're not as forward thinking when we come to disability as society would like us to, to, to believe. And I think a lot of it gets brushed under the carpet. Um, you know, I work in the entertainment industry and um, I'm very fortunate that I do get to pop up on television and radio now and again. But if we look at, you know, the representation of, of, uh, of on-screen talent, I think with adverts, it's 0.06%, so under 1% of on-screen talent you know within commercials are disabled and I believe that on-screen talent in general is only about 3.2 percent and when you think that one in six people have a disability um it that's just pretty shocking and it's quite sad and it's quite you know scary to think that we've got the black lives movement who you know have really for me as a, a, a woman with a disability have left me feeling really empowered and, and to, to kind of say that you know the the treatment of disabled people and anyone who's different just you know we can't stand for it anymore um but i've just heard on the news today about there's going to be a shortage of housing i'm in an adapted home i feel very blessed to be in an adapted home um but i know that i'm one of the very lucky few so to speak and not to sound ungrateful even though i've got this wonderful adapted home is that going to be my lot for the rest of my life? You know, um, will I be able to work work my way up? Will I be able to be financially stable to to go and potentially move somewhere else? So I think, you know, um, I think 
there is a lot that we can talk about. I mean, I won't speak much more because there's other people and I really want to drink my hot chocolate. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily think we are, are, are in a place where we, 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 we should be, obviously or where many particularly non-disabled people believe that that disabled people are in and that's why one of the reasons why I, I kind of do the campaigning that I do and um, yeah and, and try and be a good advocate and ally to, to, to others. Fantastic. I think um, perhaps if I just add to that I, I, I very much agree with the view uh, that Sam's expressed which is that all is not well for disabled people in 20 first century that's clearly true I would though say that uh, I'm older than the rest of my panel colleagues here and I'll just give you a couple of examples when I got polio in 1949 my mother was allowed to visit me once a month for one hour uh, and I was in the hospital for three years continuously that would never happen today so we've seen changes huge changes in some areas but terrible progress in others so sam mentioned housing uh, my father was disabled at ms we were placed in a, a, a accommodation in fulham that was on the fourth floor there were no lifts so my father couldn't walk i had polio we were encapsulated in a flat on the fourth floor that could happen today that that could just as easily happen today so housing mm. is a big issue if you wanted me to very briefly say what I think the issue is, it's very simple. It's attitudinal. It's, you know, we, we talk about physical features, you know, people like me and Ross, when we're looking at banks and you think about accessibility, they've come miles over the last 20 years. You know, most of us in wheelchairs can get in. Blind people do have some accessibility issues still, but it's improved. Deaf people still have some issues, you know, people. So you could say things have improved quite considerably in, in a number of areas. But the reason we're still in the mess we're in is not about physical features. It's about the lack of understanding by the legislators to think differently. And I think Sam's mention of Black Lives Matter, there's an enormous heart searching going on now about the way people have treated people from different racial groups. And quite right too. Where's the equivalent for disabled people? Where's the equivalent that says that disabled people's lives matter too? and that we should be getting some kind of recognition for that. So for me, it's about attitudinal shift. Until people think we're worth something, they will continue to do what they've always done. So there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, ben, have you got anything to add on that one? Yeah, so I wrote an article recently uh, about um, the accessibility in gyms. That's sort of my area of expertise and how I found over the years, like. A lot of places you go, go, look, we've got a ramp you can get in and look, we've got a toilet. So I don't go to a gym to go to the toilet. I go to participate in getting fit and healthy. And I found that in different sectors as well. There's, it's great if you want to go there. And, you know, if you, for example, if you want to go to a theme park, you can get into the theme park. We've got all these toilets, but you can't get in on any of the rides, for example. So it, it seems to be this, um, I, from personal experience, Disabled people aren't involved in the conversation when talking about accessibility. It's always non-disabled people doing it for us. And then with that, there's always gaps um, that are very glaring and very obvious to somebody who is disabled, but to somebody who's not, would they wouldn't even think of. And uh, having more people uh, like ourselves involved in the conversation, involved with planning, involved with the legislation, you know, uh, there's plenty of experts throughout the disabled community in different areas and to get them more involved in those planning stages is I think really important. And Ross, um, anything to add on that one? <clears throat> so yeah, I could, um, I could repeat some of the same things. Yeah. I think um, Phil knows me really well and whilst I'm not, a, I don't live in a world where I think it's perfect. I think it depends on which way you also look through the lens on these things. So there are, lots of disabled people who are facing lots of barriers but there are also lots of disabled people who are overcoming some of those barriers are probably oblivious to some of those barriers because their outlook is that you know kind of it's probably my own outlook the world wasn't built for anyone other than the perfect person and the perfect person doesn't exist so um, there's always going to be some barriers i don't think we'll ever reach a period where 
there is a utopian world that is suitable for everyone and everything. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we've already spoke about people from, you know, um, you know, black people, you know, I'm sure some people of different sexual orientation feel the world has got barriers. Um, but on a, you know, being real, if you're asking me the, the things that I see in kind of through my lens and through the community that I, um, I guess, kind of circulate or, or network and talk to, I think one of the biggest barriers for disabled people who are in need of care is, is things like good carers. Um, access to good carers it's so hard to find that I'm, I'm lucky I have some but other people you see advertising weekly for, for carers and the funding to pay that the, the caring job is not viewed as a job that is you know a, a good job to have so therefore it's you know the rewards are not as good as other jobs so people don't go into that career and actually it's a really good career so that's a really big barrier Phil's touched on housing so accessible housing if you for example want to have some smart technology occupational health still want to put in some big clunky boxes and make your house look really special um that you know they don't think about people who are disabled who have the same aspirations as you know people who are not disabled to have a nice home and things like that um and i think you know kind of yeah in terms of sort of you know access to um you know facilities access to facilities better but touch with it you know everywhere has a disabled toilet for example or, or a lot of places have a disabled toilet so you can go to the gym and there's a disabled toilet one of the biggest things not just in the uk but in in the world and you know you see a lot of people predominantly have a carer of the opposite sex so you know males tend to quite often have a, a female carer and females sometimes have a male carer um you go you know to the world especially outside the uk you walk into america and they've got a disabled toilet in the males and a disabled toilet in the female, and you arrive after a nine hour flight where you haven't been able to go to the toilet with your female carer. And you're thinking, how are we going to get over this situation? One of us has got to draw the short straw. So I think inclusivity at design isn't thought about. That's probably where the barriers still exist. It's getting better, but it still exists. So, kind of to summarize what I've said, I think you know, you, you could paint a very negative view on things, but I think there's also the lens you look through things through. I tend to find Yes, the world isn't perfect, but it doesn't get me down that it's not that perfect yet. I think um, inclusive design is a massive point because um, just as, uh, as Ben mentioned about the uh, the gyms, adaptive equipment. There's 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 one machine in my gym that is adaptive, which is a hand cycle that you can remove the chair and go on with your wheelchair. Um, but there isn't there isn't a great deal much else. You have to kind of improvise. Um, and also with the thing of the theme parks that you mentioned, there's plenty of plenty of disabled toilets, but there's not many not many accessible rides, and it's it's almost under the under the opinion of, well, disabled people wouldn't want to kind of go on these extreme rides. But I mean, don't know about anybody else, but for me, I'd love to. It's interesting because I I've been a regular visitor to, you know, Florida, one of the biggest theme park capitals of the world since yeah. the eight. Like eight. And actually, it's weird that at, between the ages of eight and 17, there was loads of rides that were accessible. And actually, it, was, it, it didn't feel any different to go there. Yeah. But now, as weirdly, as the world has evolved, places like Disney have gone very backwards. I, don't, I, don't, I think I went, I went um, a year ago to one of their new parks. There was not one ride accessible. I went to Universal Studios, Highland of Adventure two years ago. Not one ride accessible if you want to stay in your wheelchair. <laughs> Interesting. I think I think the the other part of the problem is that when we look at progress, um, I can remember the days when several of us in this meeting would not have been able to go in a cinema because you'd have been a fire hazard. Um, we tightened up on all sorts of things to do with health and safety, and in my view, by and large, absolutely rightly. But it's often used as an excuse. So when you look at the Disney World of this world. The reason used is that you might be at risk if I let you go on that ride. Well, I'm an adult. I, if I want to take risks, that's my problem. I know there's a tension between legislation and individual freedoms and stuff like that, but I, I get the point. And I think um, Ben's point about gyms and so on, uh, there is an increasing recognition that disabled people need to be as fit as anybody else, and therefore they do need to be able to use the equipment. Let me give you an exact example of the problem. I went to Specsavers today. I'm using the term Specsavers because that's where I went. It was fully accessible. Counters were lowered. Everything about this place was brilliant until I went for the eye test. 
It's in a little room with equipment that was really big and clunky. It was very adjustable if you could stand up. It wasn't so adjustable. So the first question is, can you get out of that chair to sit in our chair? No, I can't. So eye tests are about preventing, prevention. They're there to make sure that we do not go blind. I, as a good citizen, go along every year for my eye test and every year. So it's kind of thinking, we've got the room right. The room's great. They've got a toilet. Yeah. It's an accessible building. The equipment being designed by people that, obviously provide kit to ophthalmologists, hasn't even begun to think about the accessibility. And ben, Ben's earlier point about the gym equipment is just another example of that. Yeah. We've done the building, but we've done bugger all about what's going on inside here. And that clearly isn't right. It's, that's why I like the Research Institute with Disabled Consumers so much, because they're trying to do something about that. Yeah. Um, and that's very, oh, sorry, that's very similar with um, women and going for smear tests, going for sexual health absolutely, tests. Absolutely. You know, you, you know you, your, your GP can, like you said, be very, very accessible, you know, lower counted. And then as soon as you get into the, the your, you know, the doctor's uh, uh, room for your smear test, you know, um, you can't even get onto the bed. There's no hoist. Um, you know, they might not even have the right equipment, you know, there for you, which are, you know, I've been at the receiving end and I'm working quite closely with Joe's Trust, the cervical cancer uh, 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 charity, because many women are disabled women just aren't simply go going for the sexual health checks or, or mammograms, you know, because for a mammogram, you need to stand up. Yeah. Um, and Sam, with all the things we've been discussing about these barriers, um, what do you think we can do to, what are the things that perhaps the disabled community can do, can do but also the non-disabled community and all of us can do to overcome some of these barriers or help to overcome some of them? Well, I suppose the movement, you know, and, and they say nothing about us without us is the main, the main thing. I think I think where we go wrong is we don't actually listen to people with disabilities. And, and when we do, we maybe have quite a narrow tunnel vision of what disability looks like, you know, and that's, that's, that's because, you know, when you think of disability, you think of someone like myself who's a wheelchair user. Um, but actually, as we all know, disability comes in very different shapes shapes and sizes and um and we've got people with invisible disabilities long-term health chronic health conditions so i think when we look at disability first of all we need to understand what that means uh just because we've been lumbered with one title doesn't mean that we all look the same or or, or experience life the same uh, and you know it, it, it's about about letting your ego go. I talk a lot about being an ally and being a good ally and how you can be a good ally. Now there are people like me who campaign, who are there to be a source of uh, 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 questions. You know, I would never turn anyone away if they're willing to learn, but it's not up to the individual person with a disability to educate non-disabled people, you know? So I think it's about taking a bit of ownership acknowledging privilege um and not letting your ego get in the way if someone said actually what you just said to me was really quite insulting or actually you know i'm not going to be grateful because you put a ramp in there should be a bloody ramp there anyway you know what i mean i'm not going to show gratitude just because you've thrown me a a little bone like a dog you know um so i think they they would be my main main things and actually um understand that being ignorant is no longer a valid excuse I mean it should never have been an excuse but I think a lot of people you know didn't want to I always used to hear oh we didn't want to upset you we didn't want to put our foot in it we didn't want to you know say the wrong word it's like well google what words to use to uh you know to to talk about me or to use around me and and then there's no issue. I think a lot of people just couldn't be bothered. They kind of thought, well, I don't know anyone disabled, so why why should I bother? Um, and the, the funny thing is they probably did know someone disabled. They might just not have a, a visible disability. So, yeah, or, or that would be case, my main. Or in some cases, I suppose, um, if, if you are all of a sudden um, put into the world of disability, uh, you've had an accident or whatever it may be, um, then all of a sudden disability does affect you when you start looking at things obviously differently because you have to um, and mm. I think that's kind of the thing with um, accessibility as well improving access it, it's about it's almost like future proofing yourself in some ways because if if in the chances that something happens to you it's mm. going to be there for you to, to support you as well and to support your family um, totally 
Okay. Um, I suppose the other the other yeah. angle, Rich, that um, and you and Ross and me have met before. We met yeah. on you know personal development program, uh, which which the bank used to run, and I, I'm really interested in a, another dimension, which is the dimension that Ben's involved in, which is helping people stay fit and active and as well as they can be. Uh, that's his area of expertise. And the area that I worked in with you and Ross was about getting the inner person ready for the fight. So there's something going on, you know, when we talk about movements and we talk about campaigning and those kinds of things, most people, those in this conversation are probably campaigners with a bigger C, but most people aren't. They are individuals just trying to make their lives go better. Yeah. And I guess one of the things we don't do enough of is to spend time with each other comparing notes about what has worked and what hasn't worked when you went about trying to get something changed. And I'm talking obviously about things like changes at work, your career or the building you work in or your manager or whatever it is. Yeah. Plus how you argue your case in other areas for, for your rights to be listened to and heard of. So for me, part of what's missing is, and when I was very young and I went to special schools and all that stuff, there was, I was always with disabled people. They were all around me all the time. I did not meet non-disabled people. So we kind of formed an understanding together of what the world was like. When we left school and suddenly found that nobody gave a toss about us, that came as a great shock. That's changed, but what we've lost is we've lost the nothing about us without us stuff. We've lost some of that camaraderie that used to be there. And I don't know how you bring that back in a, a modern world where IT and you know social media and all those things, they're really helpful. So for me, it's partly about how do I become stronger and more assertive so that I can make demands in a way which will be listened to um, when I'm not necessarily wanting to sign up for the revolution. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think um, COVID-19 and the lockdown and things have um, obviously encouraged more and more people to go online and have these webinars mm -hmm. and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, and, and, you know, I hope these conversations continue um, because I think before this, I think lots of people used to wait until, you know, you'd wait until you'd perhaps gone a year and then you'd meet back up with that person that you were either friends with or you worked with and you had that same kind of those same discussions um and now we don't have to wait and we've proved that we don't have to wait to have those discussions we can do it now mm -hmm. um so hopefully that will be an opportunity for everyone to kind of um you know create well not not always you know create that revolution it's like almost just just to learn from each other is more even more important um ben um what do you think about overcoming the barriers so things like the gyms and stuff what do you think could be done there um so my big point on it is always trying to educate people as much as possible um and you do that by inc including us again in the conversation um to when we're pl in the planning stages so we're there to educate people on like even just to show people that we are just like everyone else we have the same wants we have the same needs you know, I go to the gym because I want to look better. And that's no different to um, anybody else, really. Uh, it's, you know, wheelchair, walking sick or able-bodied, it doesn't really matter. So just going out into like these, you know, to these people that are running the businesses and, you know, the people that like are in the planning stages. So they understand that we're not just some sort of like freak part of society that, that you, know, ha you know, doesn't have like the same wants and needs and to educate them on the fact that, you know, we are, you know, people, you know, it's disabled people, you know, there is a people part in that as well. We're not just disabled. Yeah. So having that education in there and uh, yeah, I, I don't know how we do it in every part of, you know, in every industry, but I know again, there are experts, you know, that I can see lots in this group already and um, you know, in different fields and having those people part of the conversation is really important. I, suppose I think it's also, sorry. And I was just going to say, just about you, just like be wheelchair users in a gym situation. Um, I've actually never been to a gym where I've seen a personal trainer in a wheelchair, and that is almost like you know, the, there's there's lots of wheelchair, you know, people in wheelchairs that are personal trainers, um, and 
you know, it'd be great to see that more visually in, in a gym and actually a gym think about, you know, we need to include people that reflect our community um, in the gym, not just people that can lift, um, you know, a car or whatever it may be. <laughs> um, but yeah, carry on anyway, Ben. Yeah, uh, well, I'll uh, carry on with what you were just saying there. I, it's important with every sort of, you know, in terms of personal trainers, I always say we need like older personal trainers. So, you know, for when an older person comes to gym, you can relate to it and you understand that what they're going through. You know, if someone comes to me who's, you know, gone through the similar experience I've got, they're going to have much, they're going to learn much more from me than they are going to get from like a fit 25 year old. Um, you know, and the same with if someone has been through pregnancy and all that kind of stuff. And it's no different for disabled people. But what I was going to say is that what I see a lot of is a lot of token efforts. So it's like, we've done this thing over here. Look how amazing it is. And then that's it. And there's no backup behind it you know i've seen it through like fashion campaigns or stuff like asos they do one piece of equipment you know sorry one piece of clothing and it's fantastic great thing and then nothing again and they go well we've done our bit now it's like we did this do you not remember that you know that was like five years ago so like, why didn't you buy it sort of thing and it's yeah. like we need more than just that one thing you did it needs to be a continuous uh progression forwards definitely um Sam, do you need to leave yet? I uh, yes, if you don't mind, yeah, I'm going to scoot fine. off. Just because I, uh, sorry guys, I'm not being a diva. I've got a little fracture in my leg, and I'm just taking some pain meds, and I am starting to feel a little bit loopy, but yeah. a nice loopy. <laughs> so, um, so thank you. Uh, lovely to uh, speak to you all. Much love. Yeah, thank you for joining thank us. Care, thank Sam. you. Thanks, bye, Sam. gorgeous. Bye. 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 bye, -bye. Okay, Sam is gone. Okay, so left left with the th with the four boys. Um, <laughs> That's so, very funny, is it? <laughs> so I think I just want to go into the third question now, um, which is all about the word vulnerable used by the government in the COVID nineteen situation, and what we think of that. You know. Should, is it is it something that should have been used or could they've used something different what do we think anyone could well be? <laughs> um it's interesting isn't it the labels uh when i was a kid i had infantile paralysis and then i became physically handicapped and then then i was an old polio and now i'm a disabled person and i have been a cripple at times as well you know the labels are interesting um I was with a rugby player recently, six foot five, huge, massive bloke. And he said to me, if you come at me with a 12 ball shotgun, I shall feel vulnerable. And I've never forgotten that statement because it depends on your circumstances. I do not feel vulnerable. I may be more susceptible to certain things. You know, I do have type two diabetes. I am aware that people with that condition may be more uh, likely to get very poorly if they get COVID. So I'm susceptible. I refute the word vulnerable. I refute the word special. Um, I used to get very angry when I heard people talk about special educational needs. It's not special, it's additional. We're talking about young people with various cognitive or, or major learning disabilities are no more special than my kids who don't have that thing but they do have additional needs. We do have to place them in environments where they get the best chance. Ben's gyms, you know, all that kind of fitness stuff, it's called additional needs, not special needs. It's allowing you, Rich, to get on the, the exercise bike on yeah. your own if you can, yeah. but it's not making you special because of that, right? No. So vulnerable is another great word that's putting loads of people in boxes where they don't belong. So I'm really pissed off with it, putting it bluntly. Yeah. And I'd love to know what they're going to do next time around. Because I just live for the day when they give me another label. I've got so bloody many of them. So that's my view for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ross, would you like, how can you follow that? I don't know. <laughs> um, so I, I think the word vulnerable was, you know, if you were looking at it in the, in the term, what, unfortunately, not everyone in the world is, is, is understands things like people are not you know everyone has a different level of intellect so i think they had to use a word to basically try and warn what i would call the less um, fortunate people in the brain matter to be aware that you know people 
with conditions, disabilities, are more at risk. So the word vulnerable, um, you know, puts that kind of more threatening stance on things. So it's not a very good word. Um, unfortunately, they couldn't say it out and spell out what they were trying to say is that, you know, obviously, someone in a wheelchair, someone with a complex health condition, if they get ill, if they get COVID, it takes more than one nurse to look after them. It's going to take two or three, and we don't have that many. And that's what it basically was, but we can't spread it out for that because it's too long-winded and it doesn't grab headlines. Um, equally, though, maybe as well, some disabled people might also use the word vulnerable to their advantage. So, because, you know, when you want something, you know, some people might say, well, uh, you know, I need my shopping because I'm a vulnerable adult. So you've got to be careful what you what you wish for and what you ask for and how the words used. So you can't moan about the term and then use it to kind of try and get something that non-vulnerable people may also want food, but because they're not vulnerable, they're not deemed as important. So everybody's important. Everyone's equal. Um, everyone was at risk from it. Um, but we were probably at a higher risk and that's probably a more safer word to use and a more factual word to use. Although, again, we won't know necessarily until another year down the line exactly how many disabled people might have you know got covid and and, and had unforeseen circumstances um because we, you know it, it's all it's all new so we don't know you know it's all we do know that covid has created a lot more disabled people yes we do know that much and you know i think that's the other side of this disease that people aren't picking up which is that if you recover from it and you've been really really ill the chances are that you are going to be left with some lifelong health issues to manage. And that puts you in our camp. Yeah. And, and, and suddenly you do what you just described, Rich. You were minding your own business, getting on with your life, and then suddenly you woke up and now you're a disabled person. So I'm wondering what we do to resource that side of this issue. It's one thing to save people's lives. And of course, who's going to argue with that? But but what are we doing to rehab? What are we doing to make sure that people do not lose their jobs because they're now disabled people? Those kinds of issues, I'm not hearing any. I just hear the word vulnerable. Yeah. And that can hide an, a whole range of things. Sorry, the I'm interesting, the interesting one of my thing, favorites. The interesting thing that I thought is obviously I, I'm in that group and I've been shielding um, since 23rd of March and Leicester have owned, are, are still actually in that shielding place at the moment. Um, and... I think the thing, the thing that I found interesting was every press conference uh, the government had, did, had done, they never mentioned, so if anyone's shielding that's really worried about getting back to work, because it was almost at first put under this vulnerable category and everyone just presumed, well, they must be people that don't work, don't, and it's kind of, I think it's set back people to say, well, you're in the vulnerable category, you should be at home. Um, whereas actually, no, I actually want to be out, you know, back at the bank doing what I do, doing my day job, um, and also uh, being able to go out and play sports and things that I was doing before. Um, you know, I don't want to be, um, sh I don't want to be shielded any longer than necessary. Um, I, I just think it might have changed people's view on yep. perhaps. Yeah. The, the other thing is, it it's your, you know, I speak to my friends who are disabled and non-disabled and you're, you, you know, you're vulnerable when you're not needed, but when, when you're needed, you're suddenly not vulnerable. So at no circumstance, as much as I work for a really great organisation, and yeah. as much as I, you know, I didn't actually get a shielding letter, I got a kind of halfway house letter, but at no point was it ever considered that I wouldn't be working and I wouldn't be supporting lots of people. So um, it, it's interesting uh, who, who also puts you in that vulnerable bracket. Yeah, yeah very true. Um, okay, let's just move on to talking about what's changed then so last last 10 years or so however far you want to be going back um what's changed for the positive what what positive things can we talk about um in regards to disability and how far we've come well there's three examples in this conversation of people holding down very important jobs uh working in industries which may be 30, 40 years ago would have been unthinkable, given your level of impairment. Um, I would never have ever, you say, you know, when was the last time you met a wheelchair user in a gym? You'd never have met Ben 10 years ago. That would never have happened. So Ben is a really modern addition to the tribe, you know, because, yeah. and, and I have to say, while I think of this, by the way, that Aspire 
the place at Stanmore that has an integrated gym are also training disabled people to be fitness coaches and personal trainers. So if anybody listening to us wants to kind of, or, or get in touch with Ben about it, because they really are trying to, to do what you were concerned about, Rich, which is to change the employment prospects for disabled personal trainers and stuff. So I throw that in for what it's worth. I think what's changed in my lifetime, given that I, I was born in the 1940s, is huge. I mean, the, the differences are huge. The single biggest change came in 95 when we had the, Dis the Disability Discrimination Act. That transformed our rights. We didn't have any really before that. Um, and just before that, the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act in 1970, which put in place the provisions that, that Ross now uses to live independently, employing support workers and so on. So massive changes. But what we've been talking about now is that disabled people, because we are living in the community, because we are working, because we are contributing to society in all sorts of ways, we have raised the expectations we have. We used to be just grateful for getting anything. Now we're not. Now we want to make more demands. So we want accessible equipment now in gyms. We're not happy just to be allowed in. We want to run the place. We want to be a fitness instructor. We want to build the bloody gym, not be part of a grateful generation. And I think that's where the challenge now is. It's for disabled people to say, we are not satisfied with what you've, you've given us. And we are not grateful for it because we're paying our taxes like everybody else. And we have the same rights as everybody else. And I think it's hearing that message uh, which is the one I hope to be hearing a lot more of, that disabled people's expectations are much higher now than they used to be when I was young, because I just was grateful for what I was given. Thanks, Phil. Um, so, Ben, in terms of um, kind of since, let's say, 2012, the Olympics, Paralympics in London, um, what was what was kind of what what changed since then? Did anything specifically change? I, I mentioned sport because I know you were a swimmer at some point. It, was it before your accident? Yeah. So previous to my accident, so I've been injured ten years. So for me, ten years is all I've experienced in terms of being disabled. So uh, uh, yeah, before my accident, I was a professional swimmer trainer for the uh, Olympics and um, in 2012 um, specifically, um, and then I had my accident in 2010. But yeah, the, um, in terms of what I've seen over the 10 years and like with 2012 was a good example of, um, I think it was a good way to showcase a certain group of disabled people, but it also did things in terms of pigeonholing people. Cause I get so many people go up, to, come up to me and go like, you're fit, you're in a wheelchair. Why aren't you a Paralympian? Well, I have other ambitions. You know, i I want to, as Phil was saying, I want to be the person who's running and owning and building a gym. I don't want to be a Paralympian and you know it was my ambition when I was younger to be an Olympian and it although it pushed us forwards like putting us in the spotlight these amazing people that were you know shown to be true athletes rather than just oh they do some sports that's cute sort of thing you know these are proper athletes showcasing that that's great for that but there's also pigeonholed a lot of disabled people into being like why aren't you trying to be a Paralympian too so it's been good in some aspects and not so great, good in other aspects as well. But I think overall, it's been better for exposure. You see more people on TV due to it. You know, on Channel 4, you've got like The Last Leg, for example, which is a really great way to uh, have the same people in, in front of the cameras and, you know, showcasing what we're capable of. We're not just, um, you know, somebody should be locked away in a cupboard kind of thing. And I think it's, I think you're right. I think it's developed a bit of a um, kind of rose tinted view. It developed a kind of everyone that's disabled. You can go and you know you're all going to be at the Olympics and whatever. Um, whereas there's lots of people that obviously don't have the, either those aspirations or, or so in some ways they might not get there because they can't be categorised, which is a new thing that's come about recently yeah. in terms of being categorised to be in the Paralympics. Even though you are disabled, you might not be disabled enough in some cases. Um, okay, so Ross, um, what do you think then? Ten years or or more? What what's changed? What's changed for you? What's um, easier? So I think you know. Obviously, I've worked for the same place since I left university, which is 
20 years ago. Um, and I think I've seen a big change in, in attitudes towards, you know, uh, workplace for disabled people. And because of the job that I do, I do spend a lot of time with other larger corporate organisations and they've definitely got the message around employing disabled people, facilities, assistive technology to do the, the job. I'm not saying it's it's perfect. There's still some things to go, but they're, they're aware. Um, it hasn't changed too much with with small shops and small organisations. They they don't see the purple pound. They, they don't. They don't. They're not. They're not. You know, there's no incentive for them to see it. So I, you know, I think kind of. You know, you see lots of buildings getting renovated and new cafes opening or swanky restaurants. I'd like to go and spend not my purple pound. It's just my pound. I don't like the phrase purple pound either. My money's as good as anybody else's money. We don't have the black pound. We don't have the gay pound. We just have a pound. Um, so, um, but you kind of, they get, they spend all this money upgrading it and putting new chairs, new lights in, but nobody from the council or the planning people says, well, as, as you're spending 50 grand there, wouldn't hurt you to spend three grand on, you know, making the doorway level. You know, a place in my town, they put a disabled toilet in, but they left two steps at the front door. What's the point? Don't put the disabled toilet in. I'm not getting in there. It's an absolute waste of your money. So I know some people who can climb the step will still use the disabled facility. So it's a very uh, one-dimensional view on things, but it kind of doesn't make any sense. I think, um, you know, things like sports, getting going to sports venues, that's definitely improved. Again, you know, sight lines, um, access to, to facilities at sports venues, you know, toilets, um, you know, kiosks, low counters, people that help you get through safely. Um, what hasn't changed too much is is train transport. So the price goes up every year, but the quality doesn't get better. We're still, you know, relying on somebody with a ramp. How like how difficult? The, tra- the people when I challenge the train people, they say ten years to stood exactly the same spot on the platform and it doesn't have to move left or right to go to the door. So you could put concrete on a couple of the areas can make ramp. I wouldn't need to rely on somebody. And I could go to London when I want, not when you want. Um, planes haven't got any better. So I'm painting a little bit of a negative picture here compared to earlier when I was all rosy. So, um, yeah, so some things have got better. Some things haven't really moved on. Um, I think the government could do more to, you know, punish is a strong word, but I, I just don't think, you know, if, if you don't, if you're renovating a place and you don't make it accessible, I think they should say, well, you're not open until it is. You know, and that's not just for wheelchair users. You know, do you have Braille menus? You know, do you have a signly app that someone can use? Um, is there, you know, is the music too loud for people on the autistic spectrum? It's going to be hard to please all of them, but these are things that can be done. You know, on the booking that you make for a reservation, could you take our autism and they know you're there and they suddenly mute the music a little bit in that part of the restaurant that you've sat in? There's, these things are not difficult. I suppose the other thing is that, you know, we're sitting here having this conversation pretty effortlessly um, using technology. And I don't know about you guys, but it's worked pretty well for me. I don't know what it'd be like if I was deaf or if I was blind. I don't know how good it would be then. And one of the things that's really concerning me now is a modern issue, one that we'll have to think about very hard, is that whilst it's very true to say that all our smartphones and stuff are very, very accessible to most people, you know, the Apple phone and the Samsungs and so on, Androids. What isn't is the apps. So if you get a great phone, but the app inside it isn't accessible and you're blind, then you're screwed. And this is a kind of repetition of what's happened throughout history for disabled people. Every time there's some kind of leap forward, disabled people are disabled by it. You know, when you're following a plow horse, if you're blind, you're not disabled. If you invent a machine that does that now, I'm disabled because I can't use the machine. So here we sit, having, I think, learned tremendous amount from this COVID thing about how we can talk to each other and so on and so forth. My big worry is that we've got to keep on top of the developers and the inventors and the clever guys and girls who make all this stuff and remind them that the equivalent of the toilet and the ramp has to be in the app. You have to write the software that's inclusive, just like Ben's arguing the equipment in his gym needs to be inclusive. It's no different. So each of us in our own ways needs to remind people whenever we get the chance. This is really important now because we're so reliant on this stuff. Where would we have been 10 years ago if COVID had hit? Smartphones were a dream 10 years ago. 
We didn't have Zoom. What would we have done? Sat indoors and waited for Radio 4 to tell us what was going on. <laughs> yeah? Or phone your mum to see how she was, if you could get through, because you didn't have the right change for the bloody phone box, whatever. You know, it's, it's, this is quite serious. We, yeah. we do need to take very seriously that disabled people aren't left behind by this fantastic opportunity that's opening up before us. Because we can work from home now. You know, dear old Ross has been banging on for years about a reasonable adjustment called working from home. And employers have said, you can't do that. Well, now everybody's doing it. They have no excuses anymore. But the technology has to help us, not hinder us. Yeah, I think tech is massively um, important. Um, and I think, I think the, more, the more tech we have, the better. Um, and the more people we involve in, that, in those conversations, the better as well. Um, just want to add so, to the go on, go as well. just uh, one last thing with it um, that I found in the last 10 years is uh, how much social media has helped um, communities online. Um, 10 years ago, when I first had my injury, if I wanted to find something out, there was this one forum about spinal cord injury, and you basically, you know, you had to troll through. At, hours and hours of pages or you had to sit on the phone ringing um spinal injuries association and you know eventually you'll get your uh, information nowadays with like facebook groups especially i'm um, uh, part of a number of them all i have to do is type in a question and i will get about 20 to 50 responses for all from other disabled people on how to overcome this very specific odd thing that i need to overcome um, and that has been such a game changer. Um, and that plus um, stuff like Instagram, you get to see people living their lives, seeing what they're doing, how they're adapting, YouTube as well, all these social media platforms. They get a lot of stick, but um, there's such massive benefits to them as well. And yeah, I, I know for me personally, it's been such a help when it's like, oh, how do I do this? And it, it might be like a Sunday, the SIA helpline would be closed and so they won't be open. I just can chuck a message on and then suddenly within about 10 minutes I'll have 50 responses so that's been hugely beneficial and that's only happened in the last 10 years yeah I agree with that I think that's very true so um we've got about sort of five minutes to go 10 five, five ten minutes to go um fi final thoughts then so if someone this, this is going to be released on our social media on our youtube so um kind of a final thought for people to take away that have been watching this um on just basically you know what we need what we can do better um for the disabled community um as we move forward another 10 years do we have a message um don't settle for less. If you think that other people can do it, why can't you? If you think other people can access it, why can't you? If you think other people have got privileges that you haven't got, why haven't you? It's kind of refusing to accept a second rate life because your body or mind for whatever reason aren't working like everybody else's. It's that kind of message I want. And, you know, each of us in our own individual ways are doing different things, you know, to try and, I guess, in some ways, be role models in the things that we're doing. Ben, you know, in the gym is a role model. I go in there and I see him doing that. And I think, Christ, that's brilliant. Why haven't I thought about, you know, there, there's that side of it. But there's the side of it which says, me too. Why, why am I not? Why am I not part of this conversation? So when Ross is sitting in his bank, you know, and things are going on all around him, instead of sitting there, he goes into the meeting and said, excuse me, you were talking about what? Why weren't we in the room? That yeah. nothing about us without us phrase is still really important, really important. So for me, it's wherever you see something going on that you're not part of, challenge it. Yeah. Because there may not be any good reason why, why you can't do it too. Thank you. Um, Ross? Final message for people that may be watching. Hard to repeat when Phil does it so well. Um, <laughs> so, um, I would say do what Phil does, but do it in a positive way. So as a, as, a, as a disabled person, I get really turned off by negative disabled people. As much as the world isn't positive for many of the times, 
if you're going to moan about something, moan about it in a positive way. To talk about what, it, what the difference it's going to make, not about you know the negativity part. I think that also, you know, if you if you you know, I speak to my boss quite regularly, um, and she doesn't give me an ego boost. But what she does say to me is, I like the fact that you're resilient, and I like the fact that you're positive about things. You don't come to me with the problem about you being disabled. You come to me with this is happening in my life. This is the impact. But this is the way I'm planning to adapt it. Is that okay with you? Um, and more at nine times out of ten, it, it's we're on the same page. I think being positive, you know, so like when you can't get on the train, being positive about your message. The positive thing, you know, if you if you've got to speak to a train operator, is well actually well it's not very positive for the person I'm about to put out of the job. You don't need that person doing that job. How many of them have you got around the country? How much are they costing you? Could they be used doing other things in your organisation? Or actually, could you make more profit? <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to like me those people but you know be positive about what what that difference i can make will i travel on the train more often? Probably, yes will i go into london more often for a, a meal yes so again talk to the you know restaurant person that you've gone to or the show you've gone to about you know them adding influence to that because you know your more people will come and you know people with businesses you know unfortunately money is what grows businesses and they want people to come and spend with them you know that's that's, that's a fact of life so yeah be positive Thanks, Ross. And Ben, final message for... Yes, yeah, so um, I would say that try your best to be as active in trying to change things. And it doesn't have to be, like, you don't have to march on City Hall with your placard and, you know, you, you don't have to, you know, be on the front lines kind of thing. It can be as simple as you went to a restaurant, you had a bad experience and you took the time and the effort to write an email and that reasonable change that they do at that restaurant, for example, could mean that every disabled person that comes after you has a better experience than you did. It can, so you don't have to, yeah, as I say, you don't have to be, you know, waving your banner, you don't have to be holding your placards, but trying to do as much as you can, even if it's small, I think is uh, as much possible. And uh, we're much stronger when we're together. So the more we can do, and that, the better it will be for all of us. Perfect. Well, um, that concludes the Disabled in 2020 webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank the guests for joining us this evening, uh, Phil, Ross, Ben and uh, Sam Mantha. Um, I just want to just mention something that leads quite well from what you were saying about people going around with the placards around City Hall. Um, so the webinars that we're doing, this is the third in the series. Um, in the run-up to a crowdfunding campaign for the social enterprise that I'm involved in called Access Rating CIC. Um, now, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm keen on that comment you made about the placards is because um, it's kind of not having to protest from, um, you know, out on the streets. Um, we have created something called the Access Rating app, which enables uh, people to submit access reviews from their um, iPhone or from whatever phone you have um, and we're trying to kind of expand that as much as possible to help as many people as possible get their voice heard and also get businesses um, to collaborate with us and also hear the voices of those disabled people and our, and our community um, so we're kind of giving that platform um, now the crowdfunder is also helping us with the development of projects within um, schools so we are going out to schools um, and working with young disabled children um, to look at placements work experience opportunities building their confidence skills all, di all different things um, to help them really progress as much as they can um, so that's the reason for these webinars the next webinar is going to be called the impact of COVID-19 on the disabled community some of which we have covered um, in this one about the uh, the vulnerable word as in uh, COVID-19 um, but yeah we'll be leading on to that one which should bring some more thought-provoking conversations so thanks again to our guests and um, I will see you all soon take care bye thanks very much